Hi, I'm Ryder Hask, and this is the People's TV Podcast. What has been so exciting about this is um, both pushing sort of yourself to understand how to connect with someone in a much deeper way on a shoot, and also um, in understanding better ways to bring them and involve them a lot more in the shoot, I think has been something that I really want to take away from this. And it's not something that I would have done before, but I've, I have had now two uh, just virtual kind of FaceTime meetings with both of the talent involved in that shoot, just because I have really noticed that it does allow for an easier time on set. You feel like you've already met each other. When in-person productions and photo shoots shut down last year, we looked for solutions to continue to produce high quality photographs without an in-person crew. In this conversation with photographers Jackie Pawalski and Clarence Morton, we discussed the process and techniques that we developed to produce over 200 remote photo shoots. And we also talk about what they learned that they'll be applying to their future work. Thanks for watching. Well, hi, Jackie. Hi, Clarence. Thank you so much for being on the People's TV podcast. I'm really excited to speak with both of you about our remote photo shoot project. Uh, I know that you guys have been working on this for several months now, and I'm excited to just hear more about the techniques that you've developed, what you've learned throughout the process. Um, so, Jackie, let's start with you. Um, can you please just, uh, before we get into it, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background as a photographer? Sure. Um, my name is Jackie. I am a fashion and portrait photographer here in Los Angeles. I have kind of been all over. I grew up and got my initial education in photography in on the East Coast. I uh, spent some time in London. Now I'm in Los Angeles, so I do a lot of PR fashion work. I do a lot of uh, designer lookbook stuff out here. Um, I'm also recently an award-winning producer of a short film, so uh, that's kind of what has been the last three to four years out here. Awesome. Congratulations on that award. Thank, Thank you, you, Jackie. All right. And uh, Clarence, please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Clarence. I'm uh, the lead photographer on the VA projects that we've been working on, and I am a portrait ph photographer as well in New York City. I actually didn't think that I would be a photographer growing up. I went to college for music, actually. I went to Berkeley College of Music and studied film scoring. Uh, but I always knew that I wanted to be involved in some sort of visual art. Um, so afterwards, uh, after doing a few you know, music jobs that I did not enjoy as much, there was an opportunity to work with um, or under a uh, one of the leading photographers for a ballroom dance in the country, um, Ryan Kinner Photography. And um, I assisted him for five years and then branched off and began doing artist portraiture. So, um, yeah, I, I never thought I would uh, be in uh, photography, but I, I've, I don't think I'll turn back. I've loved it ever since. Great. Um, so... I would love to hear a little bit about the process that both of you have spearheaded in developing for our remote photo shoots. Uh, I know a lot goes into it and it's sort of changed over time. Um, but Jackie, I'd love to just have you walk us through kind of an overview of the process of how you've kind of organized your shoots and approached them from start to finish. Of course. So, so there is, uh, a multi-layer casting process that we go through. Uh, that has definitely changed over time as we've evolved the process. I think initially we weren't focusing as much on internet speed. And I think the, the more the project has gone on, we've asked those questions in different ways because it's not something that people think about very often. We're not over here all checking our internet speed because for this process, you're really just depending on what they're able to bring you. And it's almost in many ways more challenging for them because they're having to think about things that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be their responsibility. So you, you kind of want somebody who's able to engage with you and um, talk to you on those vetting calls and really bring some amount of personality so that you know that as you're explaining the technical side to them, they're still going to be able to engage with you as a person, 
and, and bring their personality to the shoots. So that's really what we're looking for in those vetting calls. And then as we get somebody who's approved, then we get into these intro calls. We have a kind of multi-step system there when we're just explaining what the process is, what the project is, um, sort of just general outlines about how the images are meant to look. We're really letting them know that this is going to be, you know, a multi-hour project, whether that's phone calls or actual photo shoot. It's going to be something that's going to take a bit of time and letting them know that there's some expectation of, you know, we might encounter technical problems. We might have to make adjustments. We might have to, uh, after our first shoot, have you back and just make some additional adjustments there. So just really making sure that they know what the process is. So it's there's kind of no surprises once we get to shoot day. For the, the process itself, we've, again, kind of adjusted our process over time. So that's been really nice. Um, we've done every kind of version at this point, and I think Clarence can attest to that, every time we're using a different capture device. So every time you're encountering a different puzzle. Um, but when we get onto the shoot, we've prepared a shot list that we've gone over with them already. And we kind of work with them as we would on a, on a normal photo shoot. You know, you're guiding them through posing, you're instructing them art, on art direction. So, you know, anything that we can see in the screen, we were adjusting, we're looking for anything that's distracting. Um, we're, you know, instructing on wardrobe. So we're still doing all of that in a digital setting. It's just um, very condensed in a one square Hollywood format. <laughs> and then Keith, I would love to just see some of those because it's a slightly different body position to just see how that's coming across in the camera. Really, I've been sort of like a coach to people. And the last little slide that we'll go over is just our framing. It, it feels almost like uh, just becoming friends with people on calls and just walking them through the steps of photography a lot more than actually uh, being a photographer on the day. And so I, I, I sort of explain it in that way. Uh, so as a lens of, you know, making friends with someone and actu actually just walking them through how to sort of accomplish a goal. Um, and I think that's the easiest way to sort of uh, sum up what it is that we do on a day to day. So I know that just in this last round, the team completed 75 remote photo shoots, which is a ton. Uh, and Jackie, as you mentioned, uh, every single one of them may have had a different capture device. So could you talk a little bit about the you know methods that you've used, basically trying to meet people where they're at, whichever device they have, to coach them on how to best use that device to deliver on the shot list? It's been interesting because there's now been a number of shoots where we've, we've used two devices as well. So we'll kind of use the iPhone. I think most of my my talent, it has when I've used two devices, it's been an iPhone and a, an SLR. But I'll almost use the iPhone as an orientation tool, um, something to get them comfortable, um, especially if the person doing the photography with our talent is maybe a little bit less confident with what to do with an actual SLR. So. In my particular instances, it's maybe been the, uh, the talents SLR that they have available and the person shooting them maybe have the mindset of, you know, that's too much camera for me or I don't know what to do with that. So I, I feel like the phones and the mobile devices, they're a good orientation tool. You know, you can go over things like composition, like the attention to focus, and just where things should be balanced. The general framing, you can get them really used to that, go through all of those adjustments and then bring in the SLR. And then myself or Clarence or other people from my team, we can all give just slight words of encouragement on what adjustments to make with that SLR. And then all of those things feel a little bit more familiar, especially now that the iPhones in general have the um, sort of little uh, F aperture adjustment on there, then at least it's something, oh, we just did that. You know, we, we went over and we adjusted the aperture. So it's something that I think really helps people who maybe not, you know, they're familiar with an SLR, but maybe they're not as confident 
I completely agree with you. It, it's sort of one of those, yeah, uh, necessity breeds invention sort of situations where uh, the need suddenly arised and with a little bit of innovation, here we are with this brand new concept of, okay, we can actually make a whole photo shoot happen. And while there you know, may be a different pixel quality or pixel count to the image, uh, we keep using that word like authenticity. And I, I think it really does come down to what you're saying, where people are collaborating with their families. So immediately there's that level of uh, kind of community and they'll often be jumping into the pictures uh, or we'll have what I've been really fond of is all of the guest appearances from pets, <laughs> from, you know, uh, cats to all the way up to like horses. So, you know, they're bringing that production value where you just would not have gotten a horse, you know, for the type of uh, scopes that we were working with, right? But because mm -hmm. we're actually using the real people's real settings, that kind of just comes with the package. So I'm curious, uh, Clarence, if uh, you could share your, you know, any sort of memorable experience you have from all the photo shoots you've done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think... I know what shoot Jackie is going to mention. So I will actually jump over to um, one of hers because uh, she's going to steal one of mine. <laughs> but actually, uh, last week, uh, we had this amazing shoot with uh, a comedian and a singer. And there was this very, very special moment uh, sort of towards the middle of it um, after we had gotten the you know, all of the kinks ironed out of like what framing and composition and settings are where we were really able to just like sort of uh, surrender sort of to his personality and let him sort of shine. And um, he did this performance of um, Jackie. Do you remember what song it was? I I am I was blanking right now. I about this the other two days. You were, you were, uh, it's man's world. Uh, it's, uh, right? it's a man's yes. world. Yes. I'm gonna say it one more time. It's a man's world. Whose world is it? It's a man's world. Oh, okay. I heard you. <laughs> it was just like amazing just to see him just be himself and just to let go and have so much fun on the shoot. I think without a doubt that was the most exciting moment of the of the project, I think for me, well, one of, one of the top five for sure. I love that in this process, you and I are stealing each other's shoots for favorite moments. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very telling. I know exactly which one you're going for. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I almost feel like I need to choose another one because you know, <laughs> No, but it's you have fine. To do I will be, I will be authentic to myself and I will be true to who I am. So, um, I can 100% say my favorite moment is, um, <laughs> The talent that both of you actually referred to where we were able to use uh, her horses in the photo shoot because Clarence knows I'm a big fan of including any and every animal in the house into our shoots. So I think at one of our production meetings, he had let me know there was going to be one of his talent I had, you know, two horses. And I was so excited to assist him on that shoot. I even messaged our coordinator. I was like, make sure that I'm on that shoot. I want to be on that shoot. And then at some point you also let me know that she had chickens and I was like, yes, <laughs> I was like, all of them, get them all in the shots. And I'm just assisting Clarence on this shoot. So I'm, you know, trying to behave my giddy self <laughs> in the situation and I doing her best. Horse, I know I really was trying because I think we were right towards the end of our time. And I was like, are we going to see the horses? <laughs> um, and I think it was maybe our last I want to say their last 15, 20 minutes of the shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they walked us out and we were going to set them up for the, the horse shots and they were going to kind of do them on their own. And then their horses were really like lovely and they were, they were like really easy to position and everything. And at some point we had taken a few shots and then she was like, Oh, do you want me to put the chicken on the horse? And I was like, my face just like I again this is me trying to play it cool and failing miserably 
And Clarence is like, um, actually, that would be wonderful. Jackie has been actually waiting for this situation to happen the whole time. Because I feel like at some point I had mentioned, oh, maybe we could put the chickens on the horses. I don't know why. This is just something I've always wanted to see in my life. And it was able to be facilitated through these photo shoots and unprompted by me. So I was behaving myself. She suggested it, which made it all the more amazing to me. Um, but yeah, they're some of my favorite images. And it was just a fun experience because <laughs> because it was something that I had been sort of wishing was happening <laughs> and through the magic of the universe happened. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, we'll definitely put that photo up here so people can see what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm excited to see that picture as well. Um, I know that you guys just wrapped up uh, last week on the last in this current series. Can you talk a little bit by the numbers for us of total number of, of photographs taken or any other metrics that you have? That's something we also just recently chatted about. I'm thinking that across all projects that we've done for this, um, we're somewhere around like 120, 150,000 images. So we're, we're getting a, a nice amount. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, a massive library of photographs. <laughs> Uh, so, Jackie, we've talked about, you know, some of the evolving techniques that we've used and the various ways to communicate. Um, what to you are some lessons learned that you'll kind of bring with you through other projects and just in the future, knowing what can be done on virtual, whether it's uh, a new virtual photo shoot or just going back to in-person shooting? What, what kind of stays with you from this project? I've already kind of adapted some of the things um, to how I work even in my in-person shoots. So I have two shoots that I'm in the planning phases for right now that are uh, in LA. And it's not something that I would have done before, but I've, I have had now two uh, just virtual kind of FaceTime meetings with both of the talent involved in that shoot, just because I have really noticed that it does allow for an easier time on set you feel like you've already met each other we've kind of gone through on any of those in between questions that everybody has when they get on set or the icebreaker stuff it already feels like you don't need that you know when you go into and i and i feel like it's helped my collaboration process just to be able to have that kind of face-to-face -face meeting without it having to be a face-to-face -face meeting because sometimes I feel like if you're having a face-to-face, -face, it feels very businessy when you're in the, you know, initial phases of a project. So it's it's an interesting thing. I've, I feel like there's more of a openness to beginning the process that way, even if it does end up in, a, in an in-person shoot. So I think I'll definitely be continuing that. And, you know, I've been toying around. I don't know how it would happen, but it, it does make me more excited about the prospects of maybe collaborating with a, a lot of my friends that are still on the East Coast and figuring out are there ways that we could do something together, even if it goes completely nuts and it's not good at all. <laughs> um, and one of my best friends is a, a makeup artist in New York. And I was like, how do we do that? Is there something that you can, you know, virtually tell someone how to apply makeup? She is requiring more coaxing on that end because she's a little bit less <laughs> patient than me but uh yeah she's like maybe if it means that you and I get to work together maybe we can figure it out so I just think that it it even if it creates a lot of silly things you know it's it's a nice way to keep those connections to people creatively yeah absolutely um well I know that for the whole project, while each photo shoot was different, we did spend a lot of time relying on the iPhone 11, the good old iPhone 11 Pro. Uh, so Clarence, I'm curious what your thoughts are on using this phone as a camera. And you know, if you feel like this is gonna be a camera that actually works its way into your gear bag, or if it's always just gonna be a phone to you. I think that's a really good question. Um, I know we we actually use the iPhone 11 a lot. Um, and as a, a Galaxy user, I never would have thought that I would enjoy using actually the iPhone. Um, but 
being able to sort of walk through sort of all the options that we have and the flexibility that we can have while using the phone, you can see really what it's capable of. And we captured some really incredible images, actually, that I, I never expected that we could get with a cell phone. And um, I think once you unlock sort of the potential of the phone or any um, device, really, um, it's not really the fact that you are using a cell phone or an SLR. It's really what you're able to bring to the table and what you're able to create with it that I think is really um, exciting. And so I don't know that I would quite add a phone into a kit, but I think I would definitely, I, I'll be using it a lot more for my own personal usage. Uh, and uh, who knows, um, in the future, I might end up using a, a camera phone for a few shoots. <laughs> Uh, I think I will too. You know, it, it's it's a uh, it's clear where it's going in terms of the quality. And I mean, just think about you know maybe two years ago the concept of like a a fake depth of field that didn't even exist, right? And now we're seeing it with such high quality algorithms, you can actually you know make something look pretty spectacular. Jackie, I'm curious <laughs> in your opinion of when is the iPhone at its best? Like, what are the ingredients for people to be like the most successful with that tool, whether it's an iPhone or another camera phone to take like terrific portraits or lifestyle shots or landscapes? They, they really do well with a lot of light. Um, if you don't want to have any factors in there that you're thinking about out, outside, all of those devices really shine. Um, the, the outdoor portraits that we were able to capture were beautiful. Um, we, we got really lucky that a lot of people had cloudy days and they were always worried about it. But yeah, those situations were um, just gold for those, for those devices. Um, anything that is really close to a window is going to be great as well. You see the limitations when you're, you get into areas of the home or areas of a space that are a little bit more narrowly lit or you have maybe some mixed coloring, just because the the sensor, it, you know, it's not made to be just a camera. That's not its only function as a device. So it, it's not optimized for those low light situations. Even the night the night mode setting, it's a specific setting for on a on a tripod and you know, staring at stars. You know, things that don't have a lot of movement or getting long exposures of cars. So having that night mode doesn't necessarily mean that now that you can just shoot wonderful portraits at night with these devices. So yeah, the more, the more light that you have, these devices are really going to be great for that. And I think overall it, they're good choices and that's all it is. It's a choice. You know, each camera has a different feeling. Each camera has a you know, kind of different situation where it's like the perfect choice. And I think these are really great choices for quick, as well as intimate portraits of people, because sometimes people can be intimidated by an SLR, especially now that we're all being photographed so much. I think people really feel like the iPhones are casual, so they don't get as stiff. So it's not always about megapixels. Sometimes it's about the reaction of the person. So sometimes, even if it's a smaller file size or lower mega megapixels or anything like that, the, the image that you get is so much better that that camera is the right choice. So all of these are just factors in whatever your process is for selecting a camera. Um, so Jackie, I know that we started incorporating some accessories to the iPhones in particular. Uh, talk about what those were and how they kind of affected the image. Of course. So we are looking into... Uh, incorporating Moment lenses. So Moment is a mobile device camera lens company. So they create a whole range of camera lenses. And what we've been specifically looking at are the 18 millimeter lens and the 58. Um, right now, my opinion of them is, is they are beautiful, but we need to be using the, with the phone mount. So right now, the sort of hypothesis and testing that we were going through was to see if they have an M mount and it's what you use if you have a device that is not 
a like an iPhone Pro. So you can use it on a Samsung, you can use it on a Pixel Galaxy, you can use it on a laptop. Um, but we've kind of, through testing, figured out how to make these things work for us. And one of our, not I wouldn't say biggest issues, but one of our struggles when we were on the shoots was being able to see everything from our laptop outposts. <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of always hosted on somebody's laptop and you're really limited by that front-facing camera on the laptops. So where we're probably going to be utilizing that mount is as an expanded field of view for those laptop cameras. So that gives our photographers and everybody from the agency just a wider field of view to be able to see maybe where our talent is as well as where their helper is and everything else in the room so that our field of vision is not quite so up close. Now the 58, I think when it's mounted on the actual um, iPhone case, because it comes with a case, that way the lens is able to be really flush up against the other lens. I think it's really beautiful. It doesn't quite give you that artificial um, bouquet that the algorithm does, but it'll give you more of a lens bouquet. So it's just, again, about tool for the job. So I think for some clients, for the portraits, that really, really blurred effect might be desirable. But I think sometimes for the lifestyle shots, it doesn't really make sense or it's it's not, you know, really picking up the best areas to blur. So that's where I think really the 50A would be wonderful. You know, I think it'll give you that filmic depth of feel. So you'll still be able to see some things in the background, but it will feel like a natural image. So I'm excited about, about putting that into more... Um, wide testing out on these shoots and things like that. Cool. Well, I think we've covered a lot here. Um, you know, this is, this has been really fun to chat about all this stuff with you. I don't know if you had, you know, some like final thoughts. Um, I mean, I know that for me, it's just kind of reinvigorated my, uh, desires to be like a teacher, you know, like I really do enjoy the instruction. I'm not sure if, you know, it's, change your outlooks at all. But for me, I certainly, you know, want to pursue more opportunities to not just be the the doer, so to speak, but also to be the coach and the mentor. That's always been something that excited me. And I'm just more inspired now to to pursue that. What has been so exciting about this is um, both pushing sort of yourself to understand how to connect with someone in a much deeper way on a shoot and also um, in understanding better ways to bring them and involve them a lot more in the shoot, I think has been something that I really want to take away from this. Um, I do a lot of, uh, you know, artist portraiture and things like that, where it's, um, you know, understanding sort of uh, someone's desires or, or what they would love to create and um, taking sort of their, their, dream and bringing it to life but getting them a bit more involved in the process because it's, it's almost like a handoff like they tell me sort of what they're interested in creating and then from then on after we sort of iron out what they're looking for I just sort of take control and make it um, but I think being able to sort of work with someone during the actual creative process as well has been so fun um, and I think taking that away and and making it something that we can uh, incorporate in other types of shoots as well, like in person as well. I think that would be really something special just to see, um, you know, not someone happy with just the final product, but happy also with the entire experience. And, um, you know, I think we always aim to have fun and, you know, make a shoot um, exciting and, uh, you know, something that they'll take away as an experience but i think this is just a completely different level just seeing the way people open up and um sort of fulfill their dreams of being an artist as well um is really really fun yeah you know it actually it makes me think of a very interesting question uh, again that you know comes with some controversy of like who is the photographer because what you're talking about is i mean you're such you're, you're such a conduit for the photos to be taken um 
I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, on their own, they wouldn't be able to take these pictures, right? But with your direct coaching in that live, real-time feedback uh, photo shoot, uh, you really are the conduit of the photographer. And just because they're clicking the button and standing there, I kind of feel like the ownership of that image is, in a way, you could argue that it's shared, right? Between the photographer, and in your case, you know, you may be coaching them, but you really are guiding them how to take these pictures at every level. So it's almost like a kind of a co-copyright, I would argue, <laughs> between the person holding the camera and uh, you on the other end telling them exactly what to photograph, how to pose the model, how to set the background, how to set the camera settings. So you're basically doing everything but clicking the button and standing there. And, uh, you know, to me, it actually it makes me think about how it can be, it can make photography more accessible for perhaps people with disabilities uh, who, you know, maybe for whatever reason can't hold a camera or take pictures themselves, but they can so closely coach someone to capture the image that they have in their mind that essentially they are the photographer. I agree. And I think that as we move into the next iteration of what working looks like, whether that's in a business or a creative space, I think those lines will become much more fluid and, and somewhat disappear. It's interesting that we have such a, an ownership of that, you know, that copyright word, that, that, sort of lead title. Um, I think that's always been the case. If you think about Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel, this is a getting a little bit of an aside, but you know, he didn't paint all of that himself. He was, a, he instructed his assistants to, you know, paint the clouds like this, paint the arm like this. And um, that's never really discussed, but it's interesting because as I see that factor now into photography a bit more, you know, I, I don't know where the the line is or really if there needs to be a line. I think it it's situational. And I think that as we become more open to collaboration, we can kind of let go of that need for there to be a really clear line. I mean, sometimes it's necessary for business purposes or for copyright or legality. But um, I think as a whole... Photographer, photographers can be a pretty solitary bunch, much more so than uh, film people. I kind of live straddle between the two worlds, so it, it is very different in both spaces. So I think uh, I'm excited about anything that brings uh, the photography world a little bit closer to the uh, camaraderie you kind of see in the film world. So um, don't know if it answers the question, but I feel like it can hopefully only be a good thing. Oh, that's a great comment. I don't know if I had a question there. Um, <laughs> Clarence, any any final thoughts? I think we covered pretty much everything, but I wanted to hand you the mic one more time. I think I my final thought is just that I hope that from this experience, we're always able to just sort of reflect on uh, ways that we can always be utilizing what's thrown at us. I think it's very easy to become sort of afraid of progress uh but i think this is this process has really shown us that um you know no matter what's thrown at us we always have the potential to use it and and grow from it and um, i think jackie and joy would both uh, greatly agree that this process has made us really uh, reassess a lot of you know habits maybe that we had as photographers and to really think about um what what can propel us forward what knowledge have we not been utilizing or what parts of our creativity have we not been utilizing that um we can you know maybe continue to reassess and continue to develop um and yeah i just really hope that um, as artists we're all able to continue to grow and continue to see those opportunities great well i think that's a terrific place to leave it Thank you both so much for having this conversation. Thank you, Thank you for having, having us on. Us.